Food, art or science? Pizza, with or without pineapple? And finally, what's the best cuisine in the world? This is Abbas Muhammad, a podcaster, content creator, and founder of the 28,000 plus member Halal Foodies Group. And like we all have a source which we don't remember, and we all have a destination which we cannot imagine. And we're here today to learn more about his entertaining and inspiring journey so far. All you Muslim men, if you can't cook, listen. Welcome to the Journey Towers podcast. Assalamualaikum guys, uh, my name is Abbas, Abbas Muhammad. Um, you know, myself, my family, we've been in the barrier for a very long time. Um, and, you know, I have been involved with everything from like halal food stuff to the arts um, to, you know, my professional career, which is in biotech. I uh, went and got my master's in pharmacology and toxicology. So if you Google my name and honeybees, you'll see some of my scientific articles oh, pop up. Yes. I did a lot of research on on honeybees and I mean I could talk about honeybees for hours but mm. that's not what we're here for today <laughs> right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome so uh could you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up yeah and uh how that led to where you are now yeah so little known secret I haven't grown up yet don't tell anyone <laughs> still working on that part but um let's see I was born in Kenya I'm fifth generation Kenyan my great great grandfather was a railroad engineer um, who moved from Sialkot, which is where my family's from, to Kenya to work on the railroad. And that was five generations ago. I don't know how far back you want to know the story, but <laughs> um, you know. And so that's why a lot of my family was in Kenya, and then Kenya got its independence. And at that time, a lot of my family moved to the UK, mm-hmm. and so my aunt is there. You know, my my grandparents were were there. My got my dad got his bachelor's there. And then from there, pretty much most of my closest family moved to California, uh, in Southern California for a bit, and then and then in you know in the Bay Area. So you know we've been around since Sabo was in the the trailer with the mm-hmm. basketball hoop, and uh, there was some really like peak memories. I remember I was six and I had my Amin, and it was there. Mm. at the original Sabah. So, you know, the family roots definitely go back uh, here in the Bay Area and, and at Sabah. I did, when I was, so I was born in Kenya, then I lived in the UK for a little bit, and then I moved to Southern California. Then we moved to Saudi, where I lived in Riyadh for seven years. Mm. Nice. Uh, and then uh, finally moved back to the Bay in 2005. I got my, um, I dropped out of high school when I was 15. Mm-hmm. Like, it just wasn't, just wasn't my thing mm. <laughs> like I don't know how to explain but because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, I moved here in eighth grade and everything was different like we were on British curriculum where it's like here's math and you're gonna learn all of math you know and then I come over here and it's like here's geometry here's algebra 2 here's blah 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 so you know I came here and the academic system was different the social system I mean in high school in American public school like that in itself is its own nightmare mm. Um, and I just didn't know how to navigate it. So I was really struggling in high school, not academically, but in every other way. Mm-hmm. And so I dropped out and started at Las Positas Community College mm-hmm. um, pretty much right after that mm-hmm. and uh, transferred to UC Santa Cruz, got my bachelor's in molecular cell and developmental biology at 20. Mm-hmm. And then after a couple years of working, I went back to get my um, Masters at UC Davis in pharmacology and toxicology. And I'd been an apprentice beekeeper for about a year. Mm-hmm. Like there's a farmer's market in Dublin and I went to the to the honey lady. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, it's a pretty sweet, sweet gig you got going on here. I want to see what the buzz is about, you know. <laughs> Um, so she told me to buzz off, but I kept bugging <laughs> her. Uh, and every week I would bug her until she she's like, okay, fine, you know, let's go check out check out the hives. So I was her apprentice for about a year, um, and then when I got my master's, I actually did research on honeybees and had to do some like bee dissection and pulling mm. out glands from the head and mm. you know bee brain surgery. Luckily, that my um, patients didn't have to be alive after, so <laughs> made things a lot easier. Um, so yeah, that's where I went to grad school and, you know, it's been, I think five or six years after that. Nice. Nice. That's sweet. Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot we could talk about here, but, uh, let's focus on your first move, I guess, in high school or in college towards a certain journey that you were taking. So, 
you went into biology, you said? Yeah. Yeah. So right. what was the first thing that you did that kind of got you interested in that or led you up until where you are now? Well, so, you know, when I was young, I was told there's like two paths I could choose. I could be a doctor or an engineer. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's just the usual story. Yeah. Like, it was like very clear for me in the beginning, oh, I'm not going to get a degree in journalism or, you know, in communications or anything like that. Um, that just sort of like is part of our culture as as immigrants, um, especially from like the Middle East. Like that's kind of the mentality. Right. Yeah. So I was like, OK, well, science is interesting. Math is interesting. And to be honest, I am just very indecisive. That's why my undergrad was in molecular cell and developmental bio. I was like, maybe I'll figure it out later. Or like maybe, as, so when I was in community college, I took all the physics classes I could, mm -hmm. all the biology classes, all the chemistry classes up until OCHEM. You know, I took calculus up until Calc 3. Mm -hmm. You know, just because I was like, okay, like these are the things that I'm curious about. Let's mm -hmm. see how far this goes. So I wasn't able to make a decision. So I got the most like general sort of thing in undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, and then even in grad school, I just knew I wanted to do something with bees. Mm -hmm. And so I applied to a few different schools and ended up doing a, a toxicology project as my as my research thesis. Mm. Um, but I mean, as far as like journey goes, like there's no beginning and there's no end and there's no middle, mm. right? Like I think that's one thing about about travel, and especially I'm saying this right now as I'm currently traveling. I'm a traveler right now. Mm. I'm on a journey physically through time through all of these different dimensions and. You know, whenever you're traveling, you're outside of your comfort zone, it reminds you that actually we're all just travelers in Estonia, mm, sure. right? And like we all have a source which we don't remember and we all have a destination which we cannot imagine. Mm. And we are here for this limited time, you know, bumping into other human beings and, uh, you know, the stories of our lives interweaving. Mm. And we are like this thread that, you know, pops in here, pops out there. And it's only until you take a step back and you look at the entire human experience as a whole, you see the grand tapestry that we are all weaving together. Mm. All right. Some people will be the thread. Sometimes you need just a single thread to create a border around the image and there just have a solitary journey. Mm. Some people are meant to like bring in all these other threads together, unite them and, and create like a really powerful image. And mm. so it's kind of like, um, my favorite poet, Amir Suleiman, he, he says this beautiful thing, um, and I'll, I'll tie this back in, or maybe I won't <laughs> see where it goes. But he says, you know, sometimes, sometimes in life we're like, oh, I'm not happy with my lot in life. I have like this very specific, you know, life path or like, why was I born this way in this family and this culture at this time? Mm. So he talks about the universe as a poem. And like, if you look at, for example, if you look at Hadith Kisa, right, where um, where Angel Jibreel is like, what's going on? Like, what's the big deal, mm. right? And Allah says, you know, what is like, I have not created the sun, the moon. I've not created anything in this entire universe except for what? Except for out of love for Prophet Muhammad and the Ahlul Bayt, mm. salam, right? So if you think about the light of the Ahlul Bayt, the light of Imam Ali, you know, the Prophet Rasulullah he says, Ana wa Ali min nur and wahid, me and Ali are from the same light. And this light existed before the universe existed. Mm -hmm. Right? So first there's Allah, then Allah creates this, this Nur Muhammad, mm -hmm. within which is the light of the entire Ahlul Bayt. He falls in love, and he's so in love with this light that he creates the universe purely out of love. Right? Yeah. And how did he create? This is amazing, and this is why Amir Suleiman brings up this. He's a poet, right? Mm -hmm. He created by uttering that sound, kun, which is a spoken word, mm -hmm. right? You see the powerful, the power of the spoken word, kun. Mm -hmm. And that thing that was created first was the pen, and the pen wrote, and whatever the pen wrote ended up being this poem of one stanza, the universe the poem of one verse. Mm. And so if you realize that all of the things that exist are purely just a love letter, a love poem from the creator, from the from the lover to, to his beloved, mm -hmm. that we then be like, you know, you can't imagine line number seven in a poem is like, oh, I want to be line number three. I'm not happy being line number seven. Why was I created this way? Yeah. If you got to choose your own line, it would be pandemonium. Right. Mm. But we are all placed exactly where we are placed because we all get to then 
strive to become the perfect Muhammadan metaphors in this poem of love. Mm. <laughs> Subhanallah, that's, a, that's quite a deep analysis there. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Amir Suleiman. Uh, I want to say, I, I, I can tell now why you're a podcast host. <laughs> yes, yes. No, you've got, you've got a lot to say. So speaking about that, so you have your own podcast, right? Right. Do you want to quickly tell everyone about it and um, how'd you get into that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we'll weave in like a few different threads as well because, you know, the podcast itself is called The Artistic Foodies. It's produced and hosted by Halal Fest and Gamma, Gathering All Muslim Artists. So my co-host Irfan Raidan is the founder of Halal Fest. I'm the founder of Gamma. And we bring in these two sort of elements, food and art. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like, what does food and art have to do with each other, right? Art meaning culture, including how you dress, how you look, what you, uh, how you express yourself to other people, how you commemorate and mourn the people and the things that you've lost, how you celebrate the new things in your life. This is all part of culture and art. And I think that so that meaning gets lost when we just think about art as like paintings on a wall. Yeah. But what about the movies? What about the TV shows? What about like, you know, what do you what do you what do you do with your cousins when you're hanging out during Ramadan after iftar? Like that's part of mm -hmm. the culture as well. Um, and so, and then of course you have food because through food and art, these are the two most authentic ways of expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. And by experiencing food and experiencing art, I don't care how many articles you read about a culture, I don't care how many documentaries you watch, until you've sat down and eaten their food, mm -hmm. you don't know what it's like. You haven't tasted the culture. Mm -hmm. And so these two sort of things come together and in our podcast, we explore life, through the lens of art and food. Um, and there's a lot of stories there, and we have amazing conversation. We had a, like a two-part episode about what is halal food, and like, you know, everybody always has 100,000 questions. We got a chance to ask all of those questions, you know, <laughs> vanilla extract, you know, alcohol at a restaurant, like all of those things, you know, yeah. that people ask, right? Um, but we've explored, I think season two was mainly about Muslims in the media. So uh, theater, um, Hollywood, TV, movies. We talked to screenwriters. We talked to producers, directors, writers, mm. uh, actors. Rizwan Manji, we had him on the podcast. Um, so that was really fun. And now we're in season three, which is all about um, food entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, we just had Ike on an interview, so the Ike's episode is coming out next week. And so it's always just really interesting conversations. Awesome. That's amazing, yeah. So you mentioned that you're the founder of the, what do you say it was, sorry? The, the Gamma. Ga Gamma, yeah. Gamma. yeah. So can you talk a bit about that, how that started? And, I leave yeah. you guys with a business card too, so you have that visual. There's actually a very powerful, very meaningful moment in this journey because we launched Gamma September 24, 2016, right here at Saba, where we're now oh. recording this episode. And so it is so special and meaningful to me to be back here talking about it all these years later mm -hmm. and looking back at the impact we've been able to have. So here's the card. There you go. It's a pretty cool, uh, Look pretty that. cool looking card. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. This is a nice looking card, man. So that was that calligraphy was one of the first designs and you know we 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 put it on a lot of our merch and stuff, but <clears throat> Gamma was essentially created, there's a little bit of a love story here. I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't like a little bit of a love story? Um, I got engaged that year and my wife-to-be was in Pakistan and for like eight months she was there and I was here and I was thinking, what are some things that, that she can do once she comes here um, that she can effortlessly go into? And she was an artist. At this time, I... You know, I'm fresh grad with pharmacology, toxicology, very much with my scientist hat, no idea anything about the art world, right? Mm -hmm. And I realized that there's actually not a lot of avenues for Muslim artists to express themselves and get recognized. Mm -hmm. And so initially the plan was to do just one event and have a bunch of artwork at Sabah and have like everyone to come and check it out. Mm -hmm. And um, so I launched on September 24th on my 25th birthday. And, um, and I think 200 to 300 people came. We had some spoken word on the stage and we had 20 art pieces around. And I think maybe four of them got sold, which is really, really impressive. Mm -hmm. That night, my life changed forever. I overheard kids looking at art pieces and saying, look at this art piece, it's named 
it's 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 created by someone named Muhammad. My name is Muhammad. Maybe I could be an artist too. Mm. Wow. We got to have artwork from people who said, I never considered myself an artist until tonight when someone bought my art piece. Mm -hmm. It's like, I've always done art, but I've never called myself an artist. Meaning they never gave themselves permission to see themselves as, a, as an artist until this event had happened. Mm -hmm. We had some of the art pieces were from aunties in the community like you know beta like i used to do artwork like way back in the day and then you know like you know you have life you have kids you have all these things and they got to reconnect 10 20 years later mm. with this part of themselves and their artwork was was being shown and the fact that we did it at saba center at the community and not in an art gallery means that we got to have kids there we got to have elders there. We got to have people in the community who no one's going to take time out on a Friday night to go to an art gallery, but sure, they'll come to an art thing at Saba, mm. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. It was the most impactful night, I think, that I've had in my life mm. because after that, we realized that there was this huge gap, that there's a huge need. Right after that, like we had, I think, a few news articles about the event went out mm -hmm. and people started to see it and there's, I started to get phone calls. I'm in DC, when, when are you coming to an event here? Mm -hmm. I'm in Toronto, I'm in LA, I'm in you know, mm -hmm. New York, all of these places, right? So it became very evident that this could not just be a one-off event. And um, so that was in September. In December, we ended up incorporating as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after, started a chapter in New York. Uh, a chapter in LA, a chapter in Detroit. So we've been doing stuff across the nation and we've actually even had some stuff in Malaysia. So we've had really an international impact with, with the work that Gamma has done over the last few years. That's awesome, Very man. You know, I love, I love to hear the impact that the, especially when, like for me doing this podcast, we had a mission ourselves to leave an impact on the community, the people that are listening. So it's really interesting to hear the impact that your project has you know, left or yeah. is continuing to leave on people. Yeah. So that's really cool. Um, I wanted to kind of, as you mentioned, weaving a little bit. So yeah. food is on my mind a little bit. So I want to like ask you, <laughs> my my mom's side of the family is from Morocco. Uh -huh. All right. So and Morocco is known and they have some pretty nice food. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when I go to Morocco, I see like, for example, we have the tagine. You ever heard of that? Oh, before? yeah, of course. I love yeah. tagine. So if you sometimes there's some tagines that have like intricate designs, intricate artworks. Yeah. And I just want to kind of relate the fact like of food and art together, kind of how you mentioned earlier. So maybe you could touch a, touch a little bit on that and talk about maybe some of the cooler ones you've seen before or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like you could touch on two things there. Mm. There is like the culinary aspects of art, mm -hmm. which is that. So when you're eating, obviously there's a lot of different reasons why people eat, but if you look at just the sensory experience, the taste, mm. and imagine the taste as an art form. I've been to some art galleries where you walk in and a scent artist has actually created and crafted a scent specifically for that art gallery or for that event. Wow. So you walk in and the smell is very unique and it's very intentional. The lighting, like all of your senses are activated. So if you look at the taste aspect of art um you get into like some of these like molecular gastronomy stuff where people are making these cool foams and like deconstructed yada mm -hmm. yada right what i find the most interesting is when something looks like something mm -hmm. and it tastes like something completely different oh, yeah. you know what i mean yeah. like yeah. you have you know and there's a lot of like interesting things i think like in desi culture like the first time you see a pani puri golgappa you don't know what it is mm -hmm. You know, it's like this little crispy thing yeah. filled with chickpeas and, and potatoes, and there's like a little drink on the side, and you're like, how is this gonna this, taste? Yeah. You know, like, and then you eat it, and you're just like, wow, like you could never imagine, like how do you even describe the the, the spiciness, but yet it's refreshing, and there's yeah. chakpata, but there's like so many textures, crunchy, but the potatoes are chewy, the chickpeas, and mm. you know what I mean? So you have like this ex experience, mm. yeah. and, so much with food. One thing I love about tagines, like mm -hmm. anytime, and I don't ha actually have a tagine, yeah. I just make it in a pot, you know? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I guess I should call it a stew, because okay. technically you need, it needs to be in a tagine to be called a tagine, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, but like I'll throw in dried apricots with oh. beef, with yeah. uh, whole almonds, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. chickpeas, baby carrots, potatoes. So when you're actually eating it, 
it's like every bite feels different. Mm. Every bite tastes different. Oh my God, this one is sweet. The next bite, oh, I just ate the jalapeno in there. You <laughs> yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like that variety mm-hmm. is why like that's one of my favorite things to make is like you're, you're having an experience, right? Mm. And then so and then so there's there's like the food of art and then there's also like the art of food and the mm. art of food making. In fact, I would say like, the, you know, there's the culinary arts, like it is an art in and of itself. I think my favorite description is probably like cooking is an art, Mm -hmm. but baking is a science. Mm. In baking, if you even like change your ratios a little bit, Mm -hmm. it's gonna it's gonna be messed. That's why I don't bake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I only cook, you know. You know, and um, and subhanallah, like cooking has been an amazing therapy. Mm -hmm. I really want, and this is listen to me. (laughs) I don't know which camera. That's the camera. All of you, listen to me. (laughs) All of you Muslim men, if you can't cook, listen, it's, it's, you have to raise your worth. Muslim men need to cook. In fact, like... Um, Friendly fire. <laughs> so, <laughs> until you can cook, you're a Muslim boy. Not a Muslim man. All right? So hit me up. I got, got lessons, you know? <laughs> I can teach you. Um, it's funny. People say that the place of a woman is in the kitchen. Mm. I don't disagree. Women do belong in the kitchen. <laughs> as do men, as do children, as do grandparents. Everyone belongs that's in the kitchen. That's it, yeah. Okay? Um, I don't know if you want to keep that joke. <laughs> cause some controversy. Don't cut me like in the middle. No, 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 no. <laughs> we won't cut you in the middle. Um, that's so, a good point, yeah. You know, so everyone belongs there. It's true. You know, if you have if you have a kid, if instead of like trying to get your kids out of the kitchen while you're cooking, invite them into the kitchen, give them really simple tasks, mm. get them involved. Subhanallah. You know, my um, it's interesting when my when my parents got married, my mom actually didn't really know how to cook, mm-hmm. and when we were living in the UK, we were living with my aunt, my dad's sister, mm-hmm. and she was really into cooking, and my grandmother's really into cooking. Mm. And because they're Kenyan desi, like the style of food was like very interesting. Now my mom was born and raised in Saudi. Mm. And so when she started to learn how to cook around the time where I was being born, she learned from uh, Kenyan recipes, from Saudi recipes, um, from, you know, basically like all sorts. Because she was coming at it fresh, she was picking so many different recipes from so many different places Mm. and different styles of cooking, right? So always from like from when i was born like you know one night we'd have moussaka the next night we have kukupaka with mandazi you know the next night it'll be chicken curry the next night is Shah Jahani palau you know mm. and then the next night is like philly cheesesteaks or barbecue wings like this is i grew up on a very international palate mm. you know and um and having my aunt who's who, I think she's got like three published cookbooks now. She's got a whole website, sabihaskitchen.com. There's the plug. Sabihaskitchen.com Sabiha's Kitchen. Sabiha's has sure. a bunch of recipes. All of our family recipes are there. So yes. it's like really from all over the world. Mm. Um, and so really having women like these in my life, my mom, my aunt, and my grandmother, mm. like I just absorbed all of that passion, that love for cooking. And I think it was... Um, I was 15, I was in the Boy Scouts. Mm. (laughs) This is a funny story, I was in the Boy Scouts. We had a competition, Uh um, which was basically cook. It was a cooking competition, but you can only cook with stuff that you can take with you on a camping trip. Mm -hmm. So you have to show up with a cooler, you know, you can't have like fancy, all this fancy stuff, fancy gear, no, you show up with a cooler full of ingredients and make something right then and there within an hour. Mm. And I made, Chapli kebab burgers with a cream of mushroom soup on the side. Mm. And so when it came time for the judges to try, they're like, okay, it's a burger. Like, I don't see what's so special. But keep in mind, like, we're all like kids. So the quality <laughs> wasn't. Anyway, so he took a bite out of this Chapli kebab burger and I was like, I was not expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> that flavor, the masala, like all the dhania, like all the, the onions, all the stuff that's in, that was in the kebab itself. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you know, one first place. And it was a taste of that victory. I was like, wow, I think I'm good at this. Mm. 
you know and of course like would not have been able to succeed without my without my mom she was the one who gave me the idea taught me the recipe helped me like prepare and pack for it you know what i mean but that confidence that i got from there mm -hmm. then i started cooking at home i started cooking when i moved for college i started to you know really want to learn how to cook for myself and that's kind of how i got into into cooking nice. and now i've like taught i've taught cooking classes i've taught mm -hmm. cook, kenyan cooking classes punjabi cooking classes um, I have a whole uh, series of videos of Ramadan recipes on YouTube. So if you want to know how to make samosa or chicken karai, uh, brindi masala, stuffed dates, faluda, yeah. we make mango kulfi on there, uh -huh. uh, you know, pakore, like all sorts of recipes you can find online. Um, I did that videos a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're nice, yeah. So I know you're definitely like know everything there is, not everything, but a lot of what there is to know about food, cooking and all of that. I remember uh, before Ramadan, I was planning on doing a video series related to food. It didn't work out, but hopefully next Ramadan. But yeah, whenever I was like, I was like, just trying to think, who should I reach out to? Yeah. Everyone would say your name and then Brother Irfan. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you're definitely the guy for that. But um, so yeah, if you're a Muslim in the Bay Area and you're looking for halal food, most likely everyone has heard of this halal foodies group that right. runs in the Bay Area. So it's a Facebook group. I think it's also a WhatsApp. There, it started it, as a WhatsApp. Started group as chat. WhatsApp. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a really big group. Twenty eight thousand members, I believe, on the Facebook when I just checked last. So yeah, could you talk a bit about that? How that started? What that's all about? And when did it like really take off? How did you start? And how did it take off? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Bay Area Halal Foodies represent in the <laughs> building. We out here, Saba Center. Um, gosh, it started as a WhatsApp group chat. And, you know, gosh, there's so many WhatsApp group chats. I mean, mm -hmm. you know the vibe. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. But this was like, you know, it started as just like a few few people. You know, you mentioned Arafan. He's the founder of Halal Fest. Um, and so him, myself, and a few people were in this group in the beginning. And then it really ballooned in size. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that it was very difficult to kind of keep up with conversations and threads because everyone's kind of talking at the same time. And it was really difficult to also like, you know, kind of see people's reviews and like look through and search. And it wasn't very organized. It's a group chat, right? Mm. So we started this Facebook group. Um, I started it six, seven years. I don't even remember now. <laughs> I started the Facebook group a long, long time ago. Yeah. And, um, and so in the very beginning, it was like really exciting. Oh my gosh, we hit 100 members. Mm. That's so crazy. I remember when we hit 500 members, I was just like losing my mind. I'm like, there's so many people in here. Um, when we hit the pandemic, that's when really I noticed that our growth started to increase in a major way. Mm. And I think this goes to show also the compassion that is in human nature, it's a lot of people realize that these restaurants are now struggling. Mm. How can we support the restaurants? Where are the halal Muslim owned restaurants so we can go and help out our Muslim brothers and sisters mm -hmm. by getting takeout from there, mm. right? This was a big, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a big push like, you know, support your local restaurants, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> around that time also, a lot of um, home cook operations started to spring up. There's now like a bunch of home cook operations that have really sprung up from uh, from the Facebook group, really. Like there's a lot of people like, oh, yeah, I want to get into catering. I want to get into cooking. Um, Baez Grill, for example, is doing yeah. really good now. Mm -hmm. um, mashallah, they're like booked up every weekend, you know what I mean? Lunches and dinners. So, you know, he's killing it. And from his posts, like a lot of people see it mm -hmm. like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, uh, people who have booked him for their experiences at their parties will come on the group and be like, communication was amazing, food was phenomenal, you guys should book him. And then, you know, this is how the business grows, right? Yeah. So during the pandemic, that's when our growth spurt really started. And I started to see, I think we got a thousand new members every month wow. for like a steady year and a half. Like that was our growth rate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we hit 2000, I threw like a, a meetup at Porta Perry Perry in Fremont, you know, a bunch of people showed up, complete strangers, right? Yeah. And you get to meet each other over the love of halal food, nice. right? Um, and then we hit 5,000, we hit 10,000. When we hit 10,000, mm -hmm. I launched Halal Restaurant Week through the group. Mm. 
Now, Halal Restaurant Week is a concept that had never been explored in, in, in I think, the entire Western Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, when I was doing my research, the only other Halal Restaurant Week that I could find was, interestingly enough, in South Korea. <laughs> and they are very advanced with their halal food because they're like, you know, this is hand slaughtered, this is machine slaughtered, mm. this place is halal, but they serve alcohol, like these categories. Mm. And they're like miles ahead. Like yeah. there is incredible amount of halal food in in um, South in South Korea, mm. the capital being Seoul. So you want to get some Seoul food, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so the first ever halal restaurant week was launched here in the Bay Area. Mm. And that's just another feather in the cap for the for the halal scene here in the Bay Area, right? Mm-hmm. We worked with 29 restaurants, had a full week where every day five restaurants had a different deal. Mm-hmm. And so for that week in December, all of these restaurants are getting way more people. Um, yeah. I remember Chef Lisa of Mirchi, she's like, we're going to do a brisket, brisket burger. This was like years ago. Mm-hmm and the lines and it sold out and they ran out of brisket burgers so quickly yeah. the hype was real man there was one of i think our most popular deal was uh porta peri peri they did a half off of the family platter mm-hmm. and when i talked to when i talked to samir after he said from the beginning like from 5 a.m till 3 a.m the next day there was not a single piece of the grill that wasn't being used to cook chicken wow. He said that there was something like 400 chickens and like the order you get like the quarters, right? So imagine 1,600 quarters were grilled that one day as part of the Halal Restaurant Week. That's crazy. So that, you know, balloon and then um, for Black History Month, you know, and this is the beautiful thing about food is that food is a medium through which you can do so much. So Black History Month came and, you know, I was like, well, how can we use food to combat anti-black racism within our community? Because unfortunately, then this is a reality that we do have to face, mm-hmm. especially in our immigrant communities, is that there is a lot of bias. There is a lot of racism, yeah. whether it's explicit racism or implicit racism, it exists. Mm-hmm. And when we're talking about halal food and you see a black chef, you know, the first thought shouldn't be, oh, is this halal? But when I talk to the black chefs and the black owners, they're like, the first thing that people ever ask is, is this really halal? Mm-hmm. Even if it says halal on the restaurant, mm-hmm. even if it says halal on the menu, once they see a black chef, they're like, is this really halal? Mm-hmm. Let's keep in mind that one third of, of the Muslim population in America is black Muslim. Mm-hmm. One in every three Muslims in America is black. Why then do we harbor these attitudes? Mm-hmm. So to try and combat that or to try and solve racism, <laughs> like, <laughs> we're going to solve racism. <laughs> Um, we had Black Muslim Food Week. So for two Februarys in a row, we had a mini restaurant week where it was only black halal vendors. Mm. And so, subhanAllah, like out of this, like a lot of, a lot of these vendors found new audiences mm. and people found out about these places. And a lot of people had their first ever bean pie, you know, and, mm. you know, as a little bit of uh, historical context, the bean pie is the only food that is uniquely American Muslim. Mm. All other, what you call like halal foods, like desi food is from, you know, Pakistan and India. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Arabic foods from, they're all food from other cultures, right? But in the nation of Islam, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the way he had said to his people was like, we like, you know, instead of eating sweet potato pies, mm-hmm. let's create something new. Let's create. It was all about independence and yeah, and, yeah. and 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 acting right, dressing right, eating right to really elevate your own worth as a black man in America. Mm. This is such a powerful movement mm. um, that, you know, you, you can't talk about Islam and uh, the history of Islam in the West without talking about the massive impact that the nation of Islam had. Right. And so one of those things that came out of that was that they invented the bean pie. Mm. This didn't exist before, and it only existed because of the nation of Islam. So it is the only food in America that has a Muslim history, a uniquely American Muslim history. It's a fun little, it's interesting. little tidbit. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so everything that we talked about has been, first of all, amazing what you just said. <laughs> a lot of value points, a lot of really interesting stuff that a lot of people I think can relate to and learn from. Mm-hmm. But a question for you is, where do you see yourself in the next five years? In the next five years, probably eating some hot pot. <laughs> 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 um, 
It's really, it's really hard to say. I mean, I think especially because when the pandemic came, like everyone's five year plans, like mm-hmm. just completely changed, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I think that one of the lessons that I kind of learned from the pandemic was this idea of just like not being attached to outcome. And this is, gosh, it is so terrifying Mm -hmm. because we all have like our lives mapped out for the rest of our lives. We're like, I'm gonna go study this, gonna get this job, gonna start this company, gonna, you know, hit all these targets, Mm -hmm. right? Keep in mind that there is nothing that you create, whether it's an art piece, a dish, a podcast, or a company, there is nothing that you can create in this world unless Allah wills it. Mm. Unless Allah, and you realize that actually when I say I create something, when humans say I've created bridges, I created buildings, I created roads and the cars, you forget who is the I that is creating. Mm. Right. And so we if we keep in mind and we remember that we are really just co-creators, that we that Allah is the one who is creating Mm. and we get to like share in that creative vision. That there are so many variables and factors beyond our grasp that we cannot imagine. Mm. And in fact, like some of the most impactful and life changing inflection points that I've had were completely out of my control. It's more like you have an, uh, an idea of, of what you want to do. Mm-hmm. You make a niya and you ask Allah, if this is good, then please help me. Mm. And I don't know how you're going to help me. I don't know who you're going to send that has the right introduction to so-and-so. I don't know like through what avenue or what social media or what you know flyer you're going to put into my life yeah. that's going to change everything, mm. right? Like the two of you have this podcast, the two of you met. How many generations of coincidences of random interactions had to happen <laughs> yeah. Yeah. for the two of you to be sitting here right now creating a podcast, right? Mm. Everything comes from Allah. So when you have that, it like help takes the edge off a little bit when dealing with the ambiguity of life and like the, the grand mystery of life. But where do I see myself in five years? Inshallah, if Allah wills, it's, you know, eating good food and, and serving the community along the way. Inshallah, inshallah, yeah. Awesome. Really good points there. So before we got on, we have a few rapid fire questions for you related to food. But before we get on to those, was there any advice you were given as a kid that inspired you and you want to share today for the viewers listening? I, um, I feel like I went through a lot of difficulties and a lot of challenges. Um, when I moved here from Saudi social outcast completely no friends no like i just did not understand the social structures in high school so i really like went within and tried to understand myself more the more that i go through life i realize and this is something that it's like it's easy to say but really hard to to have this in your heart which is that this dunya is not our forever place and it goes back to the journey that you're a traveler Right. If you go to Istanbul for like a three night stay, you're not going to start unpacking and buying furniture and buying art. Mm. But we treat life the same way. We act as if this is our forever home and we're like buying furniture and art and decorating our spaces if we're going to live here forever. So as, as far as advice goes, it would just be like, just remember, you're here for a little bit. Make the moments count, mm. you know, make the moments count. And that means that every interaction that you have with someone, try to make them feel good about themselves. Try to inspire them. Try to learn something from them. Everybody that you meet is a teacher if you give them an opportunity to. I like that one, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's fire, man. That's awesome. So let's get into those, uh, (laughs) those rapid fire questions. Are you ready for this? Yummy, yummy. All right, here we go. So the first one is, what is your favorite place to eat in the Bay Area? Right now, it's Hot Pot. I'm on a real Hot Pot kick. I have been for the last like year and a half. I'm just crazy about Hot Pot. I just had some last night at nice. the new place. Uh, n- the place in Newark, it used to be called Lavender Hot Pot. It's all you can eat. Now it's called Halal Street Hot Pot. Mm. I just posted about it on Bay Area Halal Foodie, so check it out. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, yeah, I just had a hot pot last night. I'm already planning on going to a different hot pot place on Monday, so nice. I'm just really crazy about crazy uh-huh. about it. Hot pot. Nice, nice. nice. <laughs> so adding on to that, what's your favorite place to eat in the entire world? 
at in, the moment. Oh, gosh, in the entire world, I would say probably Turkey. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Yeah, Turkey is amazing. And there, specifically in Konya, there's a, you know, if you go to Konya, there's a, there's some really cool ziyarets you can do in Konya. You know, Rumi is buried there. Mm. Uh, Shams is buried there. There's a lot of, like, different really interesting historical um, uh, Islamic s- saints and scholars and poets that are buried there. Mm. If you go there, you get the, go to Ali Baba Firin Kebab. Mm-hmm. Ali Baba Firin Kebab. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't heard of that. Istanbul? It, that's in Konya. Konya okay. In Konya. It's just a few few hours out of Istanbul. Right. And then the Mitha Tirit is just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, Turkey. Awesome. Next one is, what's the best cuisine in the world? It's really hard for me to say best because I grew up eating all over. And I didn't even know that I was eating international cuisine because I was just like, okay, like, what are we having? I thought gukupaka was like a, a brown dish, you know? <laughs> I had no idea. Like we say Swahili words like growing up that I thought were Urdu or Hindi or Punjabi and they're actually not. You know, when I t- talk to a Pakistani guy, I'm like, oh, yeah, did you did you happen to grab the fagia? And he's like, what's a fagia? He's like, well, that's a Swahili word for a broom. Mm. And they're like, <laughs> like what? Exactly. <laughs> you know, so f- best cuisine. I mean, these days, I think because because my family's Desi, I eat a lot of Desi food, eat a, eat a lot of Arab food. What I really gravitate towards is Asian foods, mm. Malaysian food, Singaporean food, uh, satay by the bay, a food truck is phenomenal. Um, they have chicken satays. Definitely, if you go there, this is a little tip. If you go to satay by the bay, mm-hmm. ask for the chicken satay skewers with extra jalapenos in a sandwich. Mm-hmm. You've had chicken satay has been, so you've had a spicy chicken satay sandwich. Oh my God, you have not lived. <laughs> what the Bay Area needs, if there's any millionaires, watching this podcast, you need to invest in this immediately. We need a Korean barbecue spot. Because mm-hmm. there's a couple in SoCal, but we don't have any here. Mm-hmm. We have a Hamdullah hot pot. We got, you know, Old Mandarin in San Francisco has hot pot. We've got hot pot new in Newark and then Little Lamb in, in San Jose. So we're good on that. But like, these are the kinds of foods that I gravitate towards. So mm-hmm. I, may, I always make a lot of like, I love making Korean food at home because you can't get halal Korean anywhere mm. outside of the house. So yeah. that's usually the kind of stuff that I end up cooking is what I can't get. Oxtail is another one. Oh, my God. I don't know how I've gone this far in the interview and not talk about oxtail. <laughs> oxtail changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought like that. Kukupaka goes hard. Yeah, Kukupaka. You <laughs> know what I'm talking about. You know yeah, the vibe, yeah, man. <laughs> But uh, here's a controversial one. Does pineapple go on pizza? Yes, but <laughs> only if there's also jalapenos. Mm. Mm. If you don't have the spicy to counter the sweet, it's just that's not the vibe. <laughs> and the same goes with a burger. You can have like a flame grilled pineapple slice, but you got to make it jalapeno spicy. Those two go mm. together. Mm. Without those two together, just one or the other, it's like, uh, what about the What about cherries? Cherries? Cherries, are, uh, cherries? Is that too far? Cherries on a uh, pizza? I have a friend who who, uh, who likes that. I won't knock it till I try it. Because <laughs> I've had some pretty interesting pizzas, yeah. man. Like pizza with like fig and cheese and arugula. Like you would not think that it tastes good, but it tastes really good. Or I've had some some pizzas with like drizzle of honey on top. Have you had pesto, pesto pesto pizza? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pesto is a vibe with artichoke hearts. I mean, look, when you're in California, Cal- a lot of the agriculture of America comes from California. Um, was it Watsonville or like in that area? Like that is all farmland, like outside of Santa Cruz, Monterey, like that whole area. There's a lot of farmland. Artichoke capital of the world. Mm. At least that's what they say. When I looked it up, I was like, yeah. <laughs> I Googled this. I was like, who's the artichoke capital of America? And they're like, Castroville is the artichoke capital because they said so. That's literally the only reason. It's because they declared it so. It's true. <clears throat> awesome. But, yeah. So what makes the perfect burger? What makes the perfect burger? Yeah. <clears throat> this is going to be a controversial answer. It is. All right. There's no such thing as the perfect burger mm. because... There's so many different types of burgers. I'll focus mainly on two kinds of burgers right now. Three kinds. The third is going to be a bit of a wild card. Mm-hmm. Number one is smash burgers, which is like really hot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and to make a good smash burger, you need to have like a really high surface area so you can get maximum crisp to meat ratio. Mm-hmm. You got to get the right cheeses, of course. Uh-huh. And then when you stack them, for me, like a runny egg is almost a must. Mm-hmm. Interesting. 
um, especially like shout out to Falafel Flame, Sami, um, <laughs> Samiullah, you know, Falafel Flame, Tracy, uh, Masood Bai, what's up, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> they got the Badmash Burger. And the Badmash Burger is, and then this is the second type of burger, which is like the thicker patties. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have to have like a good fat to meat ratio. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mixing your chuck with the brisket with like the various different kinds of cuts of meat. Gone are the days, long gone are the days where you just get Harris Ranch, get like the frozen hockey puck patty, throw that on the grill. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, no, 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 bro. Like go to like a proper meat market, ask them to blend 70%, 20%, 30%, you know what I mean? And so the Badmash burger, it's got the two, the two patties with the mm. cheese, and it's got the beef bacon. I personally prefer turkey bacon, but the beef is chill. Mm. And then they have a whole runny egg in there. Mm. Um, and then, of course, the sauce is crucial. So for a good sauce, you want to mix ketchup, mayonnaise, uh, um, diced up dill pickles, and a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. That mm. gets you pretty close to what the In-N-Out sauce is. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And the third wild card burger... I mean, you guys, do you guys got me talking about food, so these are not <laughs> rapid fire. <laughs> the Wild Card Burger, and there is one place that does this in the Bay Area, which is Any Burger. Um, they have a spot in Fremont oh, and Pleasanton. Burger. Yeah, you can have your your burger any way you want it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, they have this burger where instead of the bun, it is a waffle. Yeah, uh -huh. I see that. And it's not waffle it. batter; it's actually shaved potatoes. So it's a hash brown oh, wow. in the shape of a waffle. And then inside that, you've got your, your, your burger patty mm -hmm. and the egg. And you drizzle some, like, um, what's it called? Maple syrup on top of that wow. burger. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, wow. I really miss it, man. So it seems like burgers, are they an art or science? Burgers are an art. Buns are a science. Yeah, so without bringing up any names, what's the worst service you've gotten in food related? Oh, I got a lot of names. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to offend anyone oh, here. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm coming for y'all today. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, like, I'll decline to answer that question because, and this is something that comes up a lot in the Barry Ahala Foodies is like, when I have a negative experience, mm. your first impulse is like, you want to post about it. Why? Just, you want to rant. You want to get it off your chest. Mm. A lot of people that go to Yelp right after eating, they'll do one star. But it's like if you take a pause, maybe think about it a day or two and look back, then you can have a more balanced review. Mm -hmm. And so for me, realizing that when you post a negative review, it's not just you sharing your experience, but this is something that's going to impact the restaurant. And ultimately, the people who own the restaurant, they're not millionaire tycoons. Mm -hmm. Um, that like have incredible amounts of wealth that we imagine, oh, you own a restaurant, you must yeah. be loaded. Mm. No, that's just a job. And if anything, it's a really stressful job. You're working 78, 80 hours a week mm. and your customers are, you know, you have to feed hungry Muslims and hungry <laughs> Muslims are sometimes really difficult to, yeah. <laughs> to deal with, you know? So anytime I have any negative experience, if it's truly, truly horrible, I will let the owners know, mm. this is an issue, you need to fix this. Mm -hmm. I'm looking out for you. You have to think about what is your intention. Mm, are you yeah. looking out for them, or are you out there to just blast them? Mm. So that's why you know. Uh, that, awesome. Yeah. One more. Uh, how do you keep in shape while eating all this food? Uh, well, here's the neat thing: a circle is also a shape. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so definitely keeping in shape there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. You do whatever you eat, like maybe you could take a walk or something, burn all of it off. Or yeah. Like, what are you doing? I mean, honestly, like I like there's intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. right? Which as long as you don't eat the late night snacks mm -hmm. and in the morning, like I don't really like to eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, they say the breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And I say, whenever you eat, that is your breakfast. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the mornings, I only have my coffee black. And so there's really no sugars or carbs in my system until about lunchtime. So I'm in between lunch and dinner, I'm eating a lot. And then after that, outside of those hours, I'm not really eating. So mm -hmm. it gives my body a chance to recover because I put this body through a lot. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> Shout yeah. out to God for giving the body. So we have one really serious question to end with. Um, when can you get a sponsorship? <laughs> Is this for on the record or off the record? <laughs> we can get it off the record, on the record, whichever, whichever you feel like. Man. Uh, well, Beria Halal Foodies itself as a brand is not making any money. It's not a business. It's not anything else but a service to the community. Mm. But yeah, I don't really have any money. <laughs> I spend it all on a hot pot. <laughs> <laughs>